Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and to our World War II veterans and the veterans of service since World War II, and certainly to our students that are here in attendance. It's great to see all of you. And to all of you that just plain love military history, thanks for coming out tonight. Thanks, Mr. Patton, for giving me an opportunity to take a few minutes in my official capacity. Normally, I try to sit off to the side and be low-keyed, but tonight I'm here in my official capacity as the Adjutant General for your Minnesota National Guard. Also with me tonight is Mr. Don Kerr, retired Colonel, former uh, Chief of Staff of the 34th Red Bull Division. And my purpose here tonight is to recognize an individual that means so much to all of us that are gathered here this evening and on Thursdays throughout the year. Without this individual's passion for history, for Dr. Deutsch's work and continuing it, his love of veterans of all eras, the countless hours that he spends researching renowned authors such as Jim Eccles that's with us tonight, who are here to educate and inform all of us along with panelists that are able to provide eyewitness accounts of their service. So without this individual's tireless effort, none of this would be possible. So with that, Mr. Kerr, if you'd come up. And Colonel Retired Don Patton, please come forward. If you'd read the award. The Superior Volunteer Service Award is presented to Colonel Retired Don Patton in appreciation of your service to the soldiers and airmen of the Minnesota National Guard. The Minnesota Superior Volunteer Service Medal is presented to Colonel Retired Patton for his tireless efforts over 30 years to organize and sustain the Dr. Harold C. Deutsch World War II History Roundtable. The roundtable has provided a forum for the citizens of Minnesota to interpret the impact of the events of World War II on our modern lives through interactions with veterans of that conflict and with authors and historians who have studied the events and personalities of the era. Colonel Retired Patton has worked to closely involve the leadership of the Department of Military Affairs and of the 34th Infantry Division to maximize the value of these opportunities for historical consideration for their relevance to service in the current era. Colonel Retired Patton's sustained effort has resulted in an enduring program that provides great civic value through the study and appreciation of history in a markedly localized context. His passionate volunteer service is truly worthy of emulation and reflects, reflects great credit upon the citizens of Minnesota. threatened me with a court-martial and uh, then he did this. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm speechless. <laughs> I'm uh, sincerely, sincerely uh, um, moved by this. Obviously, it's, uh, it's always it's a lot of work, but I'll tell you, I, again, I, I wish that all of you, especially the ladies, would go hug the guys that uh, work in the, in the trenches here. It's, uh, uh, we were reflecting uh, 29 years ago that it was really a one-man show, and, and uh, thanks for all the people that have uh, taken on and uh, being a part of this organization. World War II, uh, you, you can argue it's from 1910 to 1990, but it was such an important part of the 20th century. The things leading into it, the uh, effects leading out of it, and uh, things that happen today. But uh, I have learned so much from 
being involved in this. And again, uh, it's a tribute to Dr. Harold Deutsch. And uh, wherever I go, it's always uh, Harold Deutsch is well recognized outside of Minnesota. So thank you very much, sir. I appreciate it very much. New Mexico seems far away. It's not a foreign battlefield, but uh, uh, I had a, a special reason to go down there. Uh, my son was uh, in the Air Force at Holloman Air Force Base, and I, uh, I got to know a lot of great people and discovered a lot of important things that have common connections to Minnesota. I, I wanted to introduce Jim. He, uh, he's from Nebraska. <laughs> Big Red. But uh, Jim, as, as Axel mentioned, was at uh, White Sands for many years, uh, participated in the Baton Death March events, uh, and also in the Trinity site, which you'll be talking about this evening. Those are all worthwhile things. Uh, I, I encourage you to do that. And again, to go see the footprints of the Minnesota uh, World War II veterans' footprints in the uh, memorial there at, uh, at Las Cruces. Um, thank you for coming up. Thank you for coming through the snowstorm to get here. And uh, Jim Eccles, tell us about White Sands. Well, I was thinking today of something nice to say about Don for inviting me up and taking care of me this last two days and stuff, but the general's taking care of it, so we can move right along. <laughs> when Don called me, he asked about doing something joining Trinity Site, the first atomic bomb test, and V2s, these two technologies that were developed in the war, uh, how they came together at White Sands. It's kind of a funny coincidence, but they did. I think the main reason is that there's a lot of wide open space in New Mexico, a lot of desert, and it was a convenient place to do it. So we're, I had a choice when I put this together of going through the timelines and jumping back and forth because they do parallel each other. But I decided that would be too confusing for you and probably for me a lot. So we're going to go down one line and come back and go down the other line and then put it together at the end. And I do have some pictures of the uh, Bataan Memorial in Las Cruces at the very end so you can see what Don was talking about. And oh, by the way, the color photo of the atomic bomb explosion over there, that's by Jack Abey. It's the only color image of the first atomic bomb explosion. If you see a color image other than that one, and somebody's saying that was from Trinity site, walk away. They're blowing smoke. They don't know what they're talking about. All the footage, uh, the other color images, the exposures were all wrong and stuff. They didn't turn out. Jack happened to be at base camp. He was given a camera. He put it on the back of a chair, and he snapped a few images and happened to cap capture that one. Now. I wanted to tell you a little bit about White Sands because you're up here in Minnesota, you're a million miles away from uh, New Mexico, and I thought I'd put it in perspective. First of all, the missile range has fired over 40,000 rockets and missiles since 1945. That's the old logo for the missile range. This is a strip map of the missile range. It's 100 miles from north to south and about 40 miles wide. It is not 4,000 square feet, however, if you're on your toes and did your math, because this is White Sands National Monument in the middle of the missile range, and there's a wildlife refuge over here in the mountains, the San Andres Mountains, that was established to preserve and protect desert bighorn sheep. What I'm going to talk about, uh, Launch Complex 33 down here at the south end is where the V2s were launched. Trinity Site is way up at the north end. And I'd like to point out that we have extension areas here on the north and west because right away they realized 3,200 square miles is not big enough. And so we have contracts with ranchers out here to evacuate them for 12-hour periods for safety reasons. So during those 12-hour days, the missile range is about the size of Connecticut. Okay? Connecticut's got 3.5 million, 4 million people in it. We're talking about an area that's devoid of population during those tests. 
This is a different view of the missile range. We've got the Launch Complex 33 down here, Trinity site way up here, got the extension area here and there, but you've got the Oregon Mountains, the San Andres Mountains, the Oscuro Mountains, the Sacramento Mountains, the White Sands National Monument in the middle, lava flows over here. It's a big area with lots of interesting stuff going on in there. Okay, let's do V2s first. This is a typical V-2 preparation by the Germans uh, in western France to fire against England. You've got three of them up on their launch stools and they're preparing them for launch. Now these vehicles, they went with liquid fuels or liquid propellants and whatnot so that it could carry around the, the rocket empty. It weighed a lot less and uh, they could move it through train tunnels and over bridges and whatnot, which helped dictate the size and easily erect it and then put the fuel, the propellants inside. Because over half the weight, almost three quarters of the weight is propellant. So we got to have a little history. I'm a guy that likes to put things in perspective, historical perspective. And I'll tell you right now that rocket technology has been around for centuries. The Chinese put little gunpowder rockets on arrows to extend the range of the arrow back five, six centuries ago and used them quite extensively. The Koreans did a barrage rocket, a barrage arrow. They put a box on the back of a wagon and they could put 100, 200 arrows in the little slots in the, uh, in the rocket or in the uh, launcher and light them all off at once. And then in the uh, 19th century, we've got the British Congreve rocket here. And of course, that led to, in the use in the world, uh, or in the War of 1812, the words from our national anthem by the rocket's red glare. Now, in the middle of the 19th century, there was a hail rocket developed by the British, <coughs> excuse me, which was kind of revolutionary because it didn't have the stick. All these rockets up here early on are characterized by having a stick, just like your pop bottle rockets. You all had pop bottle rockets when you were kids, right? My cousin and I used to stand out in the street like gunfighters on the 4th of July and fire pop bottle rockets at each other. And the stick's the only thing that kept it kind of going in a straight line. Oops, did you lose me? Yeah. Hello? Hello? Okay. So we got to do a little science here, Isaac Newton to explain why a rocket works because I think there's an innate sense that these pop bottle rockets and these other rockets work by pushing off the ground, off the air, to propel themselves. That's not true, of course. Under Newton's law of motions, the third law of motion, published in 1687, every action there's an equal reaction. So what's happening in a rocket here is that there's an intense explosive burning of fuel and it's pushing in all directions. The container contains that and only lets the push out the back end, the flames and the exhaust. And meanwhile, there's an equal push the other direction which propels the rocket forward. So it works just as well in space or any place else. It doesn't need air to push against. Now the first guy to really write about this and propose putting a chain of rockets together to enable space flight is a Russian, Salkovsky. And you've never heard of him probably because he's a Russian and we don't care about the Russians. So he wrote about this in 1898 and uh, he explained the physics behind it too. He did, didn't just propose building rockets or a multi-stage rocket to send into space. Now let's get to the guys you probably heard of. Robert Goddard an American professor in Massachusetts. In 1919, he published a paper called A Method for Reaching Extreme Altitudes. And in that paper, he understood what Isaac Newton was getting at, and he understood what Salkovsky was saying. He proposed putting a rocket together, a multi-stage rocket, and loading it with explosive or flash powder and sending it to the moon and having everybody look at it in high power telescopes so that you could see this thing hit the moon and explode with a flash of light. Kind of like having a flash bulb go off on the, on the moon. Unfortunately for Robert, 
The New York Times didn't quite understand Isaac Newton's laws from several centuries ago. And the New York Times wrote an article saying the good professor should go back to doing things that he knows something about because everybody knows a rocket can't work in space because there's no air to push against. Uh, that affected Goddard personally. From then on, he basically worked by himself. He was a loner. He had a small team of guys, and he got some money eventually from the Guggenheim Foundation. He moved to New Mexico, where he tested rockets in the 30s, or late 20s, early 30s, uh, near Roswell. Interesting, it's near the alien crash site. Uh, anyway, uh, so he worked in isolation, but he did all these things. He perfected the pumping systems to use liquid propellants in rocket motors. He patented a lot of this uh, information. He actually built rockets. And he's considered th the father of the working rocket by any stretch of the imagination. Now, we've got to contrast that with the Germans. Hermann Obrith in 1923 published a paper about going into space. And he is a theoretical guy, unlike Goddard. And in his book, he explains all the mathematics necessary to go into space. Well, in Germany, they didn't poo-poo him. Willie Ley wrote articles about God, or, uh, Obrith and what he was proposing. And these articles became, he popularized the idea of rockets. So in Germany, Everybody goes rocket crazy in the 20s and 30s. They start building rockets. There are rocket clubs all over the country. They put rockets on bicycles, cars, airplanes. There's footage of a guy with a backpack rocket, and he's trying to be on ice skates to go across the pond. So unlike uh, America, the Germans know what's going on. And so we tie in that the rise of Hitler in the 1930s, and at first, as they start to rearm themselves, they're trying to live up to the Treaty of Versailles after the end of World War I. And so they're looking for ways to build weapons that aren't covered by the, the treaty. Rockets aren't mentioned in the treaty. So the government shuts down all the clubs and starts snarfing off all the brightest and best engineering scientist types, the people from these clubs that are building rockets. And they put them together, and they get Werner von Braun to head up the group, and eventually establish a research facility at Pinamunde, and they start developing rockets and missiles as weapons. And they had lots of different designs, something called the Wasserfall, which was going to be an air defense missile, uh, the A3 and 4 and the A5. The A5 was a huge rocket that was supposed to be able to strike the United States from Germany. They ended up actually constructing the A4, which is what we call the V2. And here you've got von Braun with some of his German military overseers. So here's a V2, and you can see some of the statistics up. There's a big machine, a very sophisticated machine with lots of engineering. And the, and the difference between Goddard and von Braun is that von Braun has teams of the top scientists and engineers working on propulsion, working on fuels, what ratios, what to do with the motor, how to do guidance, all these kinds of things. And so they make fast progress, and they build this magnificent machine during World War II. And you can see the launch weights, 27,000 pounds, 19,000 of that is propellant. The propellant's alcohol and liquid oxygen. Guess where they got the alcohol? Potatoes. They fermented potatoes. So they took a food crop, which they desperately needed, and turned it into fuel for these, uh, these rockets. Range was about 200 miles for a V2. Carried 2,000 pound warhead up here, Amatol. First successful flight was in October of 1942, and it became operational in September of 1944. So this is the first strike in England. This is Chiswick, September 1944. You see a pretty good crater here where the V2 impacted and exploded with that 2,000 pound warhead. This is Woolworths in London on November 25th, 1944. It's the worst single incident of a V2 impact where we had 168 people killed. 
Now, about 3,000 V2s were fired by the Germans. Most of them against England, particularly London, but a lot were fired in Belgium against Antwerp. Some were fired against Paris. Uh, the worst single incident for all the war was in Antwerp when a V2 hit a crowded theater during the day. And uh, 567 people were killed. So, but all told, only about eight or 9,000 people were killed using V2s as weapons. So from a standpoint of a weapon, it didn't work very well. And the reason why it was it had a terrible guidance system. If your target was London in general, the many dozens of square miles that encompassed London, yeah, you could probably hit that. But if you were looking at any particular target, say Parliament, St. Paul's, or something like that, forget it. The chances are all infinitesimally small that you could actually hit it. And one thing I wanted to point out here, this is a V-2 crater at White Sands missile range. After the first successful flight, this vehicle had no warhead, reached a high altitude, had very little fuel left, and again, it's alcohol, so it doesn't explode on impact. That is simply a kinetic energy impact of a 19 or a several thousand pound item going supersonic and hitting the ground. It's over about 30 feet deep. It's quite a hole. And I did the math on it, and based on speed and weight and whatnot, you got an explosive yield of about 2,000 pounds. So the V2 coming in had a 2,000 pound warhead, and the act of the vehicle itself hitting the ground was another 2,000 pounds of warhead. So this is my example of how inaccurate a V2 was. Towards the end of the war, we're pushing the Germans back into Germany. There's one bridge left over the Rhine. The Germans keep blowing them up. And a young lieutenant, Carl Timmerman, and his company are ordered to go and look at the bridge, uh, the Ludendorff Bridge, see if they can capture it, and they don't expect to find much. And the reason I put Timmerman in here in his name is that he's from West Point, Nebraska. <laughs> so they, get, they hear a big explosion. They feel it when they get close to the bridge. And when they get to the bridge, they expect nothing to be there, but it's still standing. The German explosives didn't all explode. And uh, the, so the bridge is still standing. Timmerman and his men rush across the bridge and capture it and are able to hold it. And we moved a lot of trucks and men over it for the next several days. Hitler was very upset. He ordered his men to fire V2s at the bridge. So on St. Patrick's Day in 1945, they launched 11 V2s against this bridge. One V2 on reentry disintegrated near the town, uh, killed some people in town, but was nowhere really near the bridge. The rest were miles away. So as a precision weapon, a weapon that could actually accomplish something, it was really a waste of effort. And some people say that if the Germans had put all that money, all that effort into the atomic bomb, maybe they would have really had something. I'd like to contrast that with the Pershing, Pershing II missile here to give you an example of how far the technology came in just 40 years. The Pershing II was uh, tested at White Sands in the early 80s, and we built a launch complex in Idaho to actually fire them 800 miles down to White Sands. And General Fulweiler was the commander then, and I had to write up some notes for him to take downtown to talk to the Chamber of Commerce. And he always liked to include some of, the, some of the current activities on the range. And so I knew how accurate this thing was, and I called the project office in Huntsville, Alabama, and I explained, and they put the colonel on, the project manager, and I explained to him, but I wanted to have the general say that he could fire a Pershing II from Boise, Idaho, basically, Mountain Home Air Force Base, and have it impact in the parking lot south of the headquarters building at White Sands. The colonel laughed, and he said, tell the general that I can put a Pershing II in his parking stall in the parking lot on the south side of the building. <laughs> the general loved it, and he used that repeatedly when he talked downtown. So at the end of the war, 
uh, Germany is being invaded. We got the Russians coming in from the east, the Allies coming in from the west, and the German V2 team at Pinamunde, they, most of them decided they wanted to surrender to the United States. They figured they'd get the best deal. So they went let west looking for Ger or, uh, American lines. And so von Braun and his team came out and the guy, one of the guys that they surrendered to is James Hamill. He led one of the teams in to recover V2 material from the assembly points, which were in Russian designated territory. Basically, he and his men stole all kinds of Russian or, uh, V2 equipment to ship to the United States. Von Braun liked Hamill. So he insisted that Hamill come along when they moved to Fort Bliss in El Paso at the, at, uh, when they were shipped to the United States. Then Hamill got stationed at Fort Bliss to be with them, kind of oversee the paperclip crew. The German scientists that were all identified, they all had a folder, and the American officials went through each individual, and they put a paperclip on the guys that they wanted to bring to the United States and use in developing more missile and rocket technology. So the paperclip crew under von Braun, with James Hamill uh, along for the ride, came down to the southwest. Hamill then in the 50s moves up to White Sands Missile Range and he runs the Ordnance Corps mission at White Sands. It's basically army testing at the missile range. And as part of what Hamill got, it was all shipped to the United States, it turned into 300 train cars filled with stuff which was put on sidings from Las Cruces almost to Albuquerque. And every day, 10 cars were unloaded in Las Cruces and trucked over to the missile range. There were no in impact, intact V2s. It was all parts and pieces. These are some of the motors that were undergoing testing, pressure testing at White Sands, preparing them. General Electric had the contract to assemble and launch these things at White Sands. This is a V2 assembly building at White Sands. Now, the V2 wasn't the only thing going on at White Sands. There was some American rocket development in the Second World War. The Jet Propulsion Laboratory in California was just formed. This is Frank Molina, the chief engineer there. They went to the government and they said, you know, if you gave us some money, we could build a rocket and we'll design it to carry a 25 pound weather package to 20 miles up in the atmosphere. And uh, the technology might eventually lead to an air defense missile or some kind of a guided missile. And the Army said okay and funded it. And so what they built was the WAC Corporal, the small rocket here. And WAC it does not refer to female soldiers. It refers to without attitude control. In other words, a free flight rocket. So Molina and his guys came to White Sands in the fall of 1945 and fired WAC corporals out of a 100-foot tower at the first launch complex. Uh, this thing was so woefully underpowered, it took a booster to get it up to speed out of the tower. It was a gunpowder-type booster. It burned for only a half a second, but it produced 50,000 pounds of thrust. So by the time the WAC Corporal, which was firing at the same time, got to the top of the 100-foot tower, it was already going 200 miles an hour. And this thing was very successful. It carried uh, these payloads uh, to altitudes of over 40 miles. So it was really something for the United States. And if it wasn't for the V-2, you'd be hearing a lot about early uh, WAC Corporals because they were the first things fired at White Sands, very successful. The V-2s finally get going in 1946 at White Sands, and the first firing of a V-2 is a static firing. It's held in place on this static test stand, the 100K static test stand, where you tie a missile down, you just run the propulsion system. So the throat of this thing, this concrete uh, 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 frame here, has got steel plates in it. And they're sh lined like shingles to take the blast from the engine and push it out into the desert to protect the concrete frame. 
So the first firing was in March of 46. Colonel Turner was the commander. He invited a lot of VIPs. The commanding general at Fort Bliss came up for the test, and a lot of other folks from Fort Bliss, and scientists were there as well. The motor ran great, but those steel plates, as soon as they got cherry red hot, and started vibrating because they expanded, the bolts holding them in place came out and the thrust of the engine threw those plates out into the desert like frisbees. Guys were scrambling for cover, underneath jeeps, trucks, whatever. Uh, Colonel Turner later said he'd never seen a general get under a truck so fast in his life. <laughs> Luckily, no one was hurt. Now, this is Launch Complex 33. This is a National Historic Landmark would be part of a national monument if the Army wasn't still using it. This is the V-2 gantry out here, and you can see a V-2 being prepared for launch. This is that WAC Corporal uh, Tower out at the launch complex. This is the blockhouse that was to protect men and equipment during launches. The walls to the blockhouse are 10 feet of solid concrete. That roof is supposed to be over 20 feet of solid concrete. Uh, it's never been tested. Uh, we don't know if it works. No V2s ever hit it. But with 10 foot thick walls, think about that, how thick that is. There are two little windows in there. It's like looking through a wrapping paper tube. So as soon as the V2 took off, you couldn't see it. It was gone. So the first launch is in April of 46. And that V2 takes off, everybody, it's crowded with VIPs and stuff, nobody can see anything. So they come out the door on the back side to watch, and that first one goes up only about five or six miles, and they cut it because it was doing all kinds of crazy things. Well, it starts back down. <laughs> and if you ever looked up in a big, bright blue sky and you lose the horizon, things look like they're overhead, even though they may be out there at 60 degrees. So everybody thinks it's coming back at them. They tried to get back in the blockhouse. There's still people coming out. It was a big mess. Luckily, the V2 crashed about a half mile to the east. No one was injured. But they put an armed guard on the gate after that for subsequent flights. Now, given that kind of a scenario in today's world, you probably wouldn't invite the news media or VIPs to your next launch. But they did at White Sands. So this is the first successful launch, May 10th. We got uh, Colonel Turner there in the center talking to a British uh, general. There's an admiral from the US Navy there and another person I don't know. Uh, they're talking before the launch. They painted it yellow and black because of the yellow they thought would be very visible. Actually, it's not. It disappears in the dark blue sky. <laughs> so this vehicle did everything it was supposed to do, very successful. The news media was there to cover it. This is Life magazine. They were there covering. A lot of other magazines and newspapers covered as well. So at, at White Sands, the main post was very primitive. In the early days, 1945, they said it's going to be a temporary post. We're going to figure out this technology, and it'll go away. Well, it didn't. But initially, the post was temporary buildings, CCC buildings from other places, some Quonset huts and whatnot. In this picture, there's only one building in that picture still standing, the one under the red arrow. That's the old V2 assembly building. A large Quonset hut. The other building under the yellow arrow was the officer's mess. That's where I reported in 1977. It turned, uh, became the public affairs office that year. But it started out as the officer's mess and then the officer's club. And I got to talk to many old timers in those early days. And one of the guys was telling me about when he would go out there for a V2 launch, they'd spend the night in the BOQ and he'd go to the club and have dinner. And whatnot. He said one night he went into the club and over the door is a big sign that says officers and gentlemen do not cheat. And on there are pasted a whole bunch of Mexican peso coins. Somebody had figured out that these almost worthless peso coins were about the size of a quarter and would work in the slot machines in the O Club. And so they were putting them in the slot machines. He said that when he left after he had eaten, it was fairly later in the evening, he looked up at the sign and all the pesos were gone, presumably pumped back in the slot machines. 
So the, the V2 at White Sands had a lot of accomplishments, and I won't go through this list. It's long, and uh, it would take up too much time. I want to focus on the one about mammals. Uh, they sent up a series of monkeys in uh, V2s, and you never hear about this because they died on impact with the ground. The other technology, the automatic deploying parachutes and stuff, didn't work. But they recorded data, heart rate and respiration rate, on one of these monkeys and recorded it and were able to recover it. And so they looked at heart rate and respiration during the g-forces of liftoff and at apogee when the rocket rolled over, basically free floating in uh, zero g or microgravity. And both heart rate and respiration rate were within normal parameters for that mammal. So it must have given scientists some confidence that a big mammal like a man would eventually be able to ride one of these puppies. Another accomplishment, here's a V2 with the WAC Corporal on top of it. This is the first large-scale two-stage rocket ever fired. And the WAC Corporal, at the end of its flight, reached an altitude of 250 miles and a speed of 5,000 miles an hour. Amazing stuff. And by any standards, this is the first man-made object in space. You know, we talk about space now being 100 kilometers, which is 66 miles or so. Uh, this is way beyond that. And uh, the Navy got interested. Whoops, back off here. This is a V-2 on the midway on the Atlantic coast being prepared to take out to the Atlantic Ocean and launch off the deck of the midway. The flight was semi-successful. The rocket got off the, the deck and went out and eventually crashed in the ocean. But this and some tests then later at White Sands convinced the Navy they never wanted liquid-fueled missiles. So not everything went hunky-dory. This is a Hermes II. It's a modified uh, V2 that the Germans built down at Fort Bliss to test uh, ramjet technology or develop ramjet technology. This particular vehicle apparently had the gyroscope miswired. Instead of going north, it went south. It overflew El Paso. It overflew Juarez, Mexico, and crashed outside of Juarez. Big hole in the ground, just like the one I showed you earlier. An international incident. Two weeks earlier, we had put a V2 near Alamogordo. So they had to shut down testing for a few weeks until they came up with a method of testing so they could keep control of these vehicles, understand where they're going, and cut them if they needed. That other uh, V2 is later in 1951. I put that in there to show you the optics capability, the film capability. You can see shrapnel, debris, way out here on the edges of this picture. And then you see a fireball in here. And this, this photography becomes important because you can tell what happened. These V2s later on, so they didn't come pointy end down, had TNT, a few pounds of TNT to separate the payload from the rest of the fuselage so they would tumble and just plop onto the ground. What they, looking at this picture, they surmised that the TNT exploded giving you this perimeter of debris that ruptured the alcohol tank inside at the top and you start an alcohol explosion, a more or less slow motion explosion because you've got to vaporize the alcohol before it'll explode. So we've got vehicles, early rockets that aren't capable of carrying atomic bombs because the atomic bombs are too big and heavy. So eventually at the missile range, the, mer the technologies merge. So this is the first rocket-propelled vehicle that the United States develops that can carry a nuclear weapon. And it's the Honest John. The only thing is it's a free flight rocket. It's uh, on the back of a truck. The truck's got to park in the direction you want to fire it. And you've got to line it up using a theodolite. And then you fire it. And it's got spin on it. These rockets impart spin, so it'll spin like a rifle bullet, and that provides stability, and it will fly out. Uh, so it's an unguided rocket. The first guided missile is the Corporal. This is a direct descendant of the WAC Corporal. JPL builds it. It's very similar to the WAC Corporal. It uses the same kind of propellants, etc. It's just scaled up with some improvements and whatnot. It's also capable of carrying a smaller nuclear warhead up to a uh, distance of 75 miles. 
But look at the prep time, nine hours to get this thing ready to fire. And then the big one was the Redstone. This is a direct descendant of the V2. The Germans in Huntsville developed this missile uh, to carry a nuclear warhead. That picture over on the right is a Redstone under test at the missile range at the static test stand. Here's a Redstone being fueled at the missile range. Interesting, this is frost on it because like the V2, it used alcohol and liquid oxygen. And this is a, a shot, and this is the statistics for a, uh, a uh, redstone. You can see it's 70 feet tall. This is a big vehicle. And because of that, it has a lot of capability. It had a range of 200 miles. But when we started to get, when we were surprised by the Russians, they put Sputnik up. The United States was desperately trying to keep up. And Eisenhower had uh, declared that he wanted to use more of a civilian-based vehicle for this kind of research. And so he had the Navy fire a Vanguard rocket with our first satellite. And of course, it blew up on launch. So they turned von Braun and the Army loose to try to launch our first satellite. And a modified uh, Redstone put Explorer 1 into space, into orbit. And not that much longer, a few years later, another modified uh, Redstone put Alan Shepard into space, our first American into space. I should also point out that uh, the Redstone was the first missile to actually launch with a live nuclear warhead on in a test at Johnston Island out in the Pacific. White Sands people went out to help on that test. Okay. This is a V-2 at the museum at White Sands Missile Range. It's cut away on the other side so you can walk along and see all the internal parts. So while the rocket and missile had centuries of technology development with rocket or arrows and things like that, the atomic age is a 20th century story and has a very precise beginning, 5.30 a.m. July 16, 1945, kaboom, Trinity site. So we got to do this a little perspective here as well. At the beginning of the 20th century, we're still learning about the atom, that the protons and the electrons and how that goes together. And in 1932, it wasn't until 32 that Chadwick in England discovers that there are neutrons in the nucleus of an atom. And uh, Enrico Fermi in 1934 actually splits atoms in his laboratory. He just doesn't realize it. He misdiagnoses the particles that he gets out of it. But and Fermi eventually wins the Nobel Prize for physics in 1938. And when he goes to Stockholm to receive his award, he takes his wife and the rest of the family, and then he just keeps on coming to the United States because his wife is Jewish. These guys, the Germans, split the atom in their laboratory in 1938, they recognized that they had split the atom. And they're the ones that coined the term fission for the splitting of the atom. They wrote papers about it. So obviously the Germans had the knowledge that you could split an atom and get this wild release, exotic release of energy from that. One of our immigrants fleeing Europe, Leo Szilard from Hungary, uh, recognized what's possible, that if you split one atom, maybe you could start a chain reaction. And if the chain reaction happened very quickly and mathematically it looked like that was possible, you could get an atomic explosion. This worried Zillard and many of the other immigrants. They started self-censoring their publications and they thought they needed to warn the U.S. government. Zlard realized that he was just an immigrant and nobody was going to listen to him, so he wrote a letter. A lot of people think Einstein wrote the letter. Zlard wrote the letter. He took it to Einstein, and Einstein signed it. That was then delivered to President Roosevelt. Roosevelt had a committee look into it, and on December 6th, 1941, day before D-Day, he signed the paperwork to form the Manhattan Project to look into developing an atomic bomb. So we're talking about chain reaction here, and we've got a neutron here that would come down and split an atom, and when you have a fissionable material like uranium-235, you get all this energy coming out, but you get more neutrons. And so you get a uh, amplification here. You got two, 
and they split two atoms. Then you got four, and they split four. And this cascading effect, this doubling each generation, which all happens in a millionth of a second or so, is what gives you this explosive release. Now, if it happens very fast, you get a Trinity site explosion, an atomic bomb. If you control it, you get a nuclear reactor. If you put enough material in their absorbance to soak up some of the neutrons, you can run a chain reaction in a controlled fashion. And Fermi did this on December 2nd, 1942, in a squash court under the football stadium at the University of Chicago. Uh, he, he ran this, the chain reaction for less than a half an hour, but demonstrated that you could run a chain reaction and control it. And some people will argue that that's really the beginning of the atomic age, not the Trinity site explosion. So there's only one natural, at this time, they're only looking at one naturally occurring element that you can fission, that you can use in an atomic bomb. It's uranium-238, 235, I'm sorry. Out there in the world, uranium is about as common as tin in the Earth's crust. But most of it is 238, which is, they're isotopes. They're the same chemically, but they're a little different radioactively. And out of every 110 atoms, 109 of them are uranium-238, which you cannot make a bomb out of, an atomic bomb. And that one atom left is uranium-235, which you can use as a bomb material. And you have to physically separate them. So the Manhattan Project sets about figuring out how to do this. And they set about setting up Los Alamos, where they're going to design and develop the first bombs. They also built Oak Ridge in Tennessee. And here are, this is part of that industrial complex. This is the uh, gas diffusion system of turning uranium into a gas and filtering it. And this is an electromagnetic process. We don't want to go into those details. But they could, at a, minute, at a time, pull out 235 from the 238. At uh, Oak Ridge, they built a reactor. And in the process of running uranium through the reactor, they discovered they made plutonium as a byproduct. They bred plutonium, which turns out to be fissionable as well. So they set about building a reactor or series of reactors at Hanford up in Washington to make plutonium. Turns out that making plutonium is a whole lot easier than uh, separating 238 from 235. They came up in Los Alamos with two bomb designs. The one on the left is the little boy, and it uses uranium-235. It's a very simple design. It simply shoots one slug of uranium-235 into another one at high speeds, down a cannon, basically. And when the two pieces meet, they become a critical mass, and a chain reaction starts, and boom, you got a nuclear explosion. This is so simple, they decided it did not need to be tested. And that's the bomb, of course, that was used over Hiroshima on August 6th. The other design used plutonium. They, they realized in Los Alamos that if you took a sphere of plutonium and sent it down at another sphere of plutonium, that the chain reaction would start before they met before they actually compressed into a critical mass. And you get somewhat of an explosion, but it'd be a very wimpy one. And so, and that's something you need to understand is that a nuclear explosion, as soon as it starts, as soon as the atoms are splitting and energy is being released, it's flying apart. It's stopping. So it's a very quick reaction that takes place. So the guys at Los Alamos came up with what they called a sweet engineering design. They would take a sphere of plutonium, and this turns out to be within a tenth of an inch or so of being the, that size. This is an 11-inch youth softball, if you want to get one and make your own plutonium core. <laughs> and they would surround it with 5,000 pounds of high explosive, 32 lenses or compartments of high explosive. And the trick was to get the, all the explosives to go off at the same instant and compress this down to, and estimates vary from anywhere from a billiard ball to a golf ball size, get the critical mass, and boom. So that they weren't sure was going to work. So that's why we have Trinity site. They wanted to test it first. 
And so they looked at a lot of different sites, uh, California, Texas, Colorado, New Mexico. They finally decided on a site at the north end of the Alamogordo bombing range. It was close by. It was already government-owned property or controlled property. It had a railroad line right by it, et cetera. Ken Bainbridge was in charge of setting that up. He was the test director. And so the first thing they did was establish a ground zero because that's where you want the explosion to take place. And then everything measures out from ground zero. The instrumentation, the bunkers, the base camp, all of that, the cameras, et cetera. So this is ground zero where they erected a 100-foot steel tower on which to test the bomb. They knew they wanted an aerial burst simulating the aerial burst they were going to use against Japan. They set up bunkers. This is a camera bunker at west 10,000 yards, five and a half miles or so from ground zero. This is the south control bunker at 10,000 yards south of ground zero. There was another one of these bunkers at north 10,000. South 10,000 is where all the controls were. It's where they threw one switch, basically, that turned on the cameras, the gauges, the seismographs, and triggered the bomb as well. And that was so it was all in sync. Oppenheimer watched from South 10,000. Base camp was 10 miles to the southwest and is on the old McDonald Ranch. And this is where most people watched from. Enrico Fermi, General Groves, uh, some of the other high muckety-mucks, and then all the support personnel pretty much watched from base camp. One thing they, they built for this test was jumbo. You can see 214 tons, 15 feet or 15 inch walls, 25 feet long. It was manufactured by Babcock and Wilcox in Babberton, Ohio, and shipped to Trinity site by rail. This train car uh, here is the only one in the United States that could carry that load. And they uh, unloaded it at the siding called Pope and transported it on this special uh, wagon trailer with 64 wheels on it, because it was so heavy, up to ground zero. They decided not to use it. It would interfere with measurements, the scientific measurements, plus if the bomb worked as anticipated, it would spew 214 tons of activated steel into the atmosphere as fallout. So there were a number of reasons not to use it. So Jumbo stood under this tower during the explosion, 800 yards, half a mile away from ground zero. So it was a test. They had to collect data. And so we had cameras like this. There's a whole row of motion picture cameras. They had a bunch of Mitchell 35 millimeter cameras to take a video of them or film of it. And in fact, most of the pictures that you see of the explosion were taken with these Mitchell cameras. Same cameras at the time that they would have filmed uh, earlier or later, earlier in the 30s, Gone with the Wind, the movies like that. They also set up barrage balloons. These were easy to come by at the end of the war. And they hung a couple of them, or guide a couple of them west of Ground Zero, and they put special neutron uh, counters in, on board. And the bomb was so successful that here are those two balloons turned to smoke two seconds into the explosion. Radiation heat has just vaporized these things. The cameras did not survive, or the instruments did not survive as well. Also, in anticipation of the test, on May 7th, they exploded 100 tons of TNT on a 20-foot tower here. This is what 100 tons of crated TNT looks like. And it served a number of purposes to calibrate instrumentation out there and also to test the timeline and the automatic uh, uh, sequencing devices. And it's good they did. They found out that they were a half second off or so in turning things on. And this is very important when you're running film at several thousand frames a second. If you turn it on too early, the film runs out in a couple of seconds and you got nothing. If you turn it on too late, you miss the whole show. So it was very important that that was precise. And they were able to make some adjustments based on the 100 ton test on May 7th. The men that worked there, there were a number of military personnel they weren't told what they were doing. They were just ordered to work and do things. The MPs, this is Marvin Davis, they were a mounted uh, patrol unit from Los Alamos. 
uh, they brought their horses with them, did not use the horses because the distances were too great. But they were able to use the horses to play polo. Captain Bush, who was the camp commander, had connections back east, and he got polo equipment for them to use. And so they tried to play regular polo with the wooden mallets and the little wooden ball, except we're talking about desert, sand, and it didn't work. So being bright guys, they got brooms, they cut off most of the wick at, or whisk at the end, and they used a volleyball, and they played polo that way. <laughs> this is Carl Rudder. He was, uh, came into the Army towards the end of the war, and uh, he was under the impression that he was a TVA lineman at the Tennessee Valley Authority. He thought he was going to go back there and work just as a military person. Uh, unbeknownst to him, they shipped him out west. After like three days of basic training, etc., they just shipped him right to Trinity Site, where he was in, what, in charge of what he called the East Jesus Socorro Light and Water Company. He was in charge of keeping the generators going, the uh, electrical lines up, the transformers working, the water pumps working, all that kind of stuff. He was a one-man shop to keep everything going. But he was one of the trusted guys. Bush let some of the guys that he trusted use the rifles that they had to go out and hunt. And they also filled one of the ranch water tanks with water and used it as a swimming pool. Now, about that polo thing, did you know there's a polo magazine? I did, no idea. They called me in 2000 and said they'd heard that uh, the soldiers at Trinity Site played polo. I said, yeah, we got pictures. So they wanted the information. I sent them the photos and sent them the information. And they then sent me a copy of their magazine. And there was a nice one-page uh, article about Trinity Site and the guys playing polo. But the problem was the first paragraph said that the Manhattan Project and a secret, pro and a secret uh, test of the first atomic bomb just outside of San Antonio, Texas. <laughs> da, 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 da. They were that close. <laughs> okay, this is Herb Blair taking the plutonium core, which came down in two hemispheres, into the ranch house, the McDonald Ranch House, at Trinity Site. And you can see he's easily carrying it in a little box here. And then the core was put together for the first time ever at, Trin at uh, the ranch house and then transported back to ground zero. Here they are loading it into the sedan to take it down to ground zero. And it takes two men and they're using a litter because the core being about 14 pounds, 13.6 pounds, if you figure out the density uh, or the diameter of this and the density of plutonium, you can come up with that weight. But it was also in a plug of uranium, which added all this weight. And so that thing, that litter, probably weighs about 120, 125 pounds. It took two men to get it into the car. So this is the ranch house. This is two miles from ground zero. This is what it looks like today. And as part of the open houses, uh, we allow people over there. You have to ride a bus to see it. And it's a neat old house. It was built in 1913 and is an amazing ranch house. So this is the bomb. After it's assembled, they put the core into the bomb mechanism down on the ground and then raised it to the top of the 100-foot steel tower and then connected all these detonators. Each lens of TNT or high explosive, 32 of them, had to have a separate detonator. And of course, this is again why they wanted to test. Each of those detonators had to go off at the exact same time as all the others because you had to crush this ball from all sides. If it would only crushed on one side and then the other side, you'd get this asymmetrical explosion and you'd uh, not get a uh, clean nuclear blast. This is Norris Bradbury up there on top. He was the next director of Los Alamos after Oppenheimer. So we've got some pictures and you probably have seen these. They're in all the books, they're in all the TV shows. Uh, of early fractions of a second of the explosion. And here's, your, uh, here's another one, a Los Alamos slide that they used to use in briefings. And I thought I'd throw 2.7 seconds. You got your uh, barrage balloons going up in smoke. And this is about 20 seconds. And this photo, and most of these photos are taken from the north 10,000-yard bunker. And Berlin Brixner was the photographer up there. He gets credit for these things. So, you saw the ball of plutonium. This is what that nuclear explosion came from. 20 kT, 20,000 tons of TNT, or 
40 million pounds of TNT. Comes from this. And when you do the E equals MC squared, actually, most of that's waste. And a gram of plutonium was turned to energy using Einstein's formula. So that's the capability of splitting atoms. So the explosion is seen all over southern New Mexico. The shock wave is felt across many places in New Mexico. Uh, this is what it did to the tower where Jumbo was. I showed you a picture of that earlier. Uh, Groves, in his note to higher headquarters, talks about this tower and how it's twisted and mangled by the shock wave 800 yards away. And he says he does not consider the Pentagon a safe place anymore. And he just built the Pentagon. He was the guy in charge of building the Pentagon. So this is an overhead view, 24 hours, 28 hours after the explosion. That's ground zero right there. And this is the asphalt roads running around it and the asphalt around ground zero to keep down dust. Jumbo is over here, still standing. And the burned area was the scorched area there. Now, material for the bombs, for the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, for the little boy bomb was already on the cruiser Indianapolis headed for Tinian. And they did it by ship because they couldn't afford to waste any U-238 in a plane crash. And so it went by ship. So the Indianapolis dropped their material off. Of course, the Indianapolis was sunk four days later by the Japanese. Uh, the material for a fat man bomb was flown over because plutonium was in the process. They were cranking it out in the reactor. And so this is the fat man bomb after assembly on Tinian, ready to go. After seeing this photo, we painted our fat man casing that we have on display of white sands yellow. Before that, it was OD green like everything in the Army. So this is a picture of the explosion at Nagasaki. The Hiroshima blast looks pretty similar. Now, I wanted to talk, give you a little bit of trivia. When we talk about the, everybody knows that the little boy bomb was delivered by Tibbetts in the Enola Gay, and named after his mother. So the second bomb, the fat man was delivered by Boxcar. When I first heard that, my impression was that they were referring to B-O-X-C-A-R, like a train boxcar, delivering a big load of bombs over the enemy, right? Well, no, that's not true. These guys named their planes for whatever. And I met Fred Bock, B-O-C-K, at Trinity Site years ago. And we talked about it. And uh, the reason it's called boxcar is because it was his airplane. It was B-O-C-K-S-C-A-R. He didn't fly that mission because his airplane was ready to go for an atomic bomb. But Sweeney, Charles Sweeney, was supposed to fly the mission. His vehicle, the, or the plane, the Great Artiste, wasn't um, changed enough or modified enough yet, hadn't been prepared to carry the bomb. And so they switched planes. Sweeney flies boxcar to deliver the bomb at Nagasaki. And Fred Bach flies the Great Artiste as an instrumentation platform during the test. And they took those pictures of the explosion. Afterwards, at Trinity site, uh, here's Oppenheimer and Groves in the center visiting Ground Zero with the news media. And of course, other people were there. This is one of the military police at Ground Zero. By the way, if you visit Trinity site, you can see part of one of these footings, just the top of it, sticking out of the ground still. One newsman that came later in September was uh, George Kameens. He's a radio reporter in Des Moines, Iowa. He, he got the S Iowa Civil Air Patrol to fly him to New Mexico. And he got to interview Ken Bainbridge, test director at Ground Zero. And we had a, one of the recordings that he did. They turned him into radio shows. ABC picked it up and turned uh, all of his series of uh, recordings into one recording, 15 minutes. And I listened to it, and it's the most boring thing you ever want to hear. They say nothing. Yeah, it was a big blast. Yeah, we worked hard. I mean, it's just, <laughs> there's not much there. These are the guys waiting for Kremins at ground zero, having a beer, 
because the war is long over, etc. And it's probably not the smartest thing they could do. They're sitting on a fairly radioactive site, uh, waiting for the interview to be concluded. And what they shouldn't be doing is drinking the beer and smoking cigarettes. Because the danger, the real hazard, is ingesting or inhaling these radioactive uh, dust particles and then lodging in your body. Here's George collecting trinitite, the glass formed on the crater floor and uh, putting them into a sack. Later on, he would go back to Iowa and do presentations about his experience and about seeing Trinity site. And he always had a glass jar with trinitite there to show the audience. This is what trinitite looks like. I'm holding a very nice large piece in my hand. And it's green because of the iron found in the sand. The Romans knew how to make green glass thousands of years ago. Just throw some iron oxide into it. Uh, at first, we thought that trinitite, this glass that covered the crater, was a creme brulee effect, that the fireball melted the sand on the ground. And that's what people said for decades. Well, a number of years ago, some guys at Los Alamos came to us and asked for some ant sand and a lot of things. We sent them samples. And in the process of doing that, we discovered that there were these spheres, perfect little balls of trinitite of glass. Well, how'd those get formed if the fire above melted the sand? And you get these dumbbell things as well. And so they started looking around at it. And they came up with a new theory that really does explain it much, much better. Sand gets sucked up into the fireball. It gets turned to a liquid or a gas. The gas comes back to a liquid. It's a mist of liquid rock up in the fireball. And then it becomes raindrop physics. You got particles bumping into other particles. You get bigger droplets. It rains down as liquid onto the ground, puddles, and covers portions of the crater. Uh, sometimes, though, the little uh, particles, raindrops, are hard enough that they keep their hardness, their shape when they hit the ground, and they're found all over the place as well. We call larger uh, balls or spheres be or pearls, trinitite pearls. And some of it's red. That's red trinitite because there are some coaxial cables coming off the tower that uh, got sucked up into the cloud as well. And that copper lends the, makes the uh, trinitite red. This is what happened to Jumbo afterwards. You saw the picture after the blast. Jumbo was intact. In 1946, they put eight 500-pound bombs in it and blew both ends off. And then it sat there at ground, or near ground zero for decades after that, except that somebody came in in the 50s and removed this layer, this nine-inch layer of banding, steel bands. We don't know who did it. There's no records. It just disappeared. And this is what it looks like now. And we moved it up to the entrance of Ground Zero so that people can uh, walk through it. The kids love it. They like to run around in there and stuff. That's still a pretty significant piece of steel. This is the obelisk at Ground Zero, marking the spot on the ground between the four legs of the tower on which the bomb was placed. OK. Trinity site has a role in the Roswell myth. Some people asked me before about the aliens. One of the questions I got asked a lot was about the aliens, where they're frozen at White Sands, et cetera, et cetera. Did White Sands do anything to have aliens come to the range? Well, and you see this alien-like flying saucer vehicle in our missile park. This was actually a NASA vehicle that was tested at White Sands. But there are a group of people that believe that the Earth is hollow, as demonstrated here. And there are holes outside at the North and South Poles. And there's a sun-like uh, energy source inside. And there are humanoids living in there. And the theory goes that when the atomic bomb was exploded on July 16th, uh, the world inside there shook. And the humanoids going, wow, what was that? What's happening? Gee whiz, something bad maybe happened. So they built a flying machine. And they flew up out of the North Pole and back down towards Trinity Site. The flying machine malfunctions near Trinity Site over to the east, which is Roswell, and they crash in 1947. So the aliens at Roswell weren't from outer space. They were from inner space. 
Okay. This is the missile range logo, but for Don talked about uh, Bataan and the connection for New Mexico. For New Mexicans, Bataan is a big deal. There were 1,800 New Mexicans that got captured at Bataan, more than any other state by a long stretch. And so uh, we had the biggest preponderance of survivors, et cetera. Uh, years ago, a uh, guy named, uh, oh, now I'm blocking on his name, one of the Las Cruces uh, businessmen whose brothers served in the, in the military in the Pacific got together an effort to build a monument to the Bataan veterans. And Kelly Hester, she won the design competition that they held. And she designed this eight-foot bronze statue and had it cast. And we've got two American soldiers and a Filipino soldier helping each other along the path. And that's set in concrete. And the sidewalk going up to them is filled with footprints. Uh, actual survivors, uh, they didn't ask them to walk on the wet concrete, but they made moldings of their feet. Some of the survivors, they uh, wore uh, era boots and shoes to make footprints into the cement there. And what happens here is that the footprints go up to them, and then beyond them, they kind of peter out, like the Bataan Death March. So this is a very moving uh, monument in Las Cruces in our Veterans Park. Now, the Bataan Memorial Death March that we do was started at New Mexico State University by an RO, some ROTC students with the help of the faculty. And uh, very quickly, they realized they couldn't do it across the open desert, across BLM property, et cetera, et cetera. The missile range stepped in and offered to take over the, uh, the event, as well as the New Mexico National Guard. So now we've been running this for years, decades. And there were 6,600 folks in the, the march uh, last Sunday. They've got a choice of doing a 26-mile full marathon length out in the desert or a shorter 14-mile length. And it is a brutal uh, marathon because there's a 1,000-foot elevation gain in it. There's soft sand in places. It's pretty nasty. I took this picture, I think, uh, the third time I walked it. I've walked it a number of times. And these guys are only about six miles in. And they're looking at their hamburger-like feet already. <laughs> it's not good when you don't have your boots right and your socks right. Uh, these are some other pictures that I've taken out on the route. This is at the beginning. You've got a lot of the military units starting. And out here in the desert with the missile range and the mountains in the background, it's just this, this line of people goes on for a couple of miles coming out of the post as they trek out in the desert. And we've always got wounded warriors now that participate. Our last, the last finisher on Sunday was a Vietnam wounded vet. He's only got one leg, and he pulled into the finish line at 10 PM, long after everybody else had gone home and stuff. But there was a small group of 40 or so people to welcome him at the finish line and uh, cheer him on as he came in. So, that is my presentation. Thank you for your attention. This is Bob Mickelson. He has a connection to Almogordo. Uh, but his m main reason we have him here is he was a, a crew member on a B-29, uh, flew 10 combat missions. And I'll let him tell you about that. Uh, I, I will say his 10th combat mission, he was shot down over Japan in a POW. And the Japanese were interested in learning what they could about B-29s. Uh, Bob, why don't you tell us about uh, your crew? Just We'll give you the signal when we've talked too long. I, he could talk for two or three hours here. He's got some interesting stories. Uh, no more than an hour and a half. All right. OK. Go ahead. And I'll chime in here. Well, I think my chore is to relate to the uh, what happened to me to the to the uh, uh, program tonight uh, concerning the uh, the atomic bombs? I found it really interesting, and uh, and particularly that page in the Trinity book showing the map of New Mexico. Because after my training as a as a um, gunner on a Beach 17 and a B 24, and I thought, sure, I'm going to England. I ended up in Alamogordo, New Mexico, at Alam we called it Alamogordo Air Force Base. 
And uh, that's the first time I ever saw a B-29. Um, for those of you that uh, maybe are too young, uh, there was a B-24 and a B-17, and then along came the B-29, which was called the Super Fortress. Uh, we trained for four months at Alamogordo, flying out uh, over uh, west from uh, Alamogordo, over uh, Arizona. And when was this? Why don't you tell us when that was? Um, let's see, we got to Alamogordo um, sometime, I think, in November of 1944. Right, I think that's right, yeah. And we trained for about four months. Uh, we were always at high altitude, of course, because the B-29 was pressurized, and we were up at 25, 26, 27,000 feet. We knew then we, were close, we would be ending up uh, flying over Japan. Um, in reality, though, when we, by the time we got to Japan, we were down at eight to 10, 12,000 feet. It was um, it, the, the 10th mission uh, that we were shot down over Tokyo. So, Bob? Sir? I, I interrupted you earlier. Tell your story about flying uh, test runs, bombing runs, when you were practicing west out of uh, Almogordo? Well, oh, we, we... Instead of north? Oh, straight west. Yeah, straight west over uh, New Mexico into Arizona, southern California, out over the Pacific, I mean, and made out 180, came back, dropped... Uh, some bombs at, at a range in Arizona, and uh, and uh, we had the, we discovered we had the world's best bombardier on our airplane. As a matter of fact, uh, the, the interesting one of the interesting things is that our crew, our uh, our uh, aircraft captain, uh, Dick Mansfield, was a former instructor on on the four engine aircraft. Our bombardier was a former instructor, engineer a former instructor. And uh, a name that is familiar to some, Thor Jorgensen, a uh, 50 caliber machine gun instructor. The schools had closed, and those that were teaching were now getting their turn to uh, go to combat. Um, where was I? Well, when you were flying, you mentioned to Jim how you flew west, always flew west on your uh, practice runs, and you never flew north. And Jim. Oh, that question. Uh, was, was there restrictions to, uh, for us not to fly over the. the uh, the, uh, the uh, White Sands site where they were testing the bomb. I know of no restrictions that we had, we were told, but we always, of course, filed a flight plan. And always, the flight plan was always west to the Pacific and then back east. Um, I, I don't remember anybody saying there's a restricted area, but I'm sure there was one. Is, is, our, is our author still here? Right. Was, was there a restriction? There probably was because uh, the guys out of Alamogordo bombed base camp uh, early on uh, because they thought it was one of the targets because there was a light there and they used to put lights on the night targets and so uh, General Groves got a hold of the commander at Alamogordo bombing range and put the whole northern part of the, the bombing range off limits to any kind of training. Well, that, so, does, that does so make tonight sense, we, but we didn't know. So tonight, uh, Bob learned why they weren't flying north. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> so, uh, I think there was a restriction on uh, on any activity over the uh, the uh, White Sands itself, though, the National Monument. There was some restriction there, but uh, but we, we we didn't have to worry about that. So tell us about your your tenth combat mission then. Well, we were. Uh, I mean, the fact that we were coming back home. Well, in fact, why don't you start out, you, you flew 10 missions. You flew uh, over Tokyo, but you also hit some airfields on your 10 oh, missions. The, the, one of the missions was to uh, the uh, southern island, Kyushu. We were uh, supporting the uh, uh, Okinawa uh, situation by uh, bombing the uh, oil and gas storage of the Japanese. Um, we were to drop our bombs on, on ra with radio contact to the squadron uh, bombardier. And as he was counting down from 30 minutes to 20 minutes to 10 to 5, our bombardier on our airplane said, we're going to miss the target. Our captain said, Mel, and his, our bombardier's first name, Mel, he said, Mel, we do not miss. And we did not. We, our bombs hit the target, and we were the only one. And when we got back, there was some severe criticism. That we we uh, we had uh, not followed orders. Of course, there was severe criticism, but they also learned that we had the world's best bombardier, 
And they said, uh, after your 10th mission, you are going back to the States for more bombardier training on special projects. What the special projects were, we had no idea. Um, after knowing, uh, learning about the, the two bombs that were dropped, we figured out that was our special mission, to go back to the States and, and do some training on uh, dropping uh, atomic bombs. We never made it. On our 10th mission, we were shot down over Tokyo. Um, uh, we, we were captured, or at least I was captured almost immediately on so, the ground. So and back up a little. You're flying over Tokyo about 8,000 feet? About 8,000 8, feet. And you're hit by flak? Uh, twice. Once on the number two engine and, uh, and, and one more burst in the tail. The tail it killed our tail gunner there. Uh, killed the uh, the uh, radio operator who had come back to uh, drop some uh, uh, tin foil to to uh, confuse the Japanese radar. Um, uh, I was captured immediately on the ground and taken to a place called Kempi Tai, which is like the Gestapo in in Germany, except that Kempi Tai are about 300 years old, and they had absolute authority over everyone in Japan. Uh, one example is is the uh, the uh, Kempi Tai controlled the University of Kyushu, and the the, uh, uh, the main surgeon, the chief surgeon there, was an admiral, and his assistant was a captain. So, uh, so it was all uh, military control, the whole place. I'm going to uh, skip some of these things here, just so we can get to the. I want to get to the part where, sure. where the, um, the Japanese are concerned about yes. large bombs. Go right ahead. May I? Yes, Thank you. Please. Okay. <laughs> um, the first interrogation was was uh, uh, you know your mother's name, father's name, where were you born, uh, what school did you go to, and they had records of everything uh, in the country, I believe, because uh, uh, I, they asked me for the phone number, and I said Dupont eight eight seven zero, and they looked it up in a telephone book, and they said you're right, you're telling us the truth. And they were asking these questions to see if I was telling the truth. You go only to a certain point and you, you don't want to say anything else. I got to that point uh, at about uh, maybe 15, 20 minutes into that first interrogation, all hell broke loose. And, uh, and uh, from that point on, I don't remember anything until the next morning. Uh, when I woke up in a hallway, I think it was a hallway, I was still tied and blindfolded. And I was there that whole day. When they took us then at, at toward the end of the day into the horse stalls, uh, uh, it was like building a prison, uh, in a, uh, using a, a horse stall as a as a as a prison, and uh, we learned there were six of them, and there was a lot of people there, and, and they they solved that problem a little later. Uh, the the uh, the crowding was uh, getting pretty bad, and they solved that problem in a in an unusual way, which, which uh, I don't think is appropriate here. Um, the second interrogation went almost the same as the first to begin with, uh, except that uh, they lowered the boom when they started talking of, of uh, B-29s, and I refused to answer. Um, after about, I don't know how long they, they worked on me, but I did answer their questions uh, in, after a certain point of, uh, a certain amount of time. The questions begin with, if you were to, if you were in an airplane and you had to fight a B-29, how would you, how would you do it? And I, I gave them a, what I thought was a logical answer, and they accepted that. The next questions begin, have you ever seen a B-29 with only a single bomb bay? And no, I've never seen that. Have I ever seen a B-29 with a modified bomb bay? No, I have not. Have you ever seen a B-29 that looks different underneath the fuselage? No, I have not. Have you ever heard of a big bomb? I said, yeah, I've heard of a bomb called a blockbuster. I've never seen one, but I've heard about it. And it was, to me, I, I, I thought I was telling them a lie. A couple of months ago on the TV, uh, the History Channel, they had bombers of World War II. And the British Lancaster had, had provision for one bomb. I, I don't know if they called it the blockbuster, but it was a 12,000 pound bomb. 
And, and uh, I thought I was lying to the Japanese, but they ex I wondered why they accepted that lie, but now I know. They also had a picture of the B-29 being loaded with, I think, the, which was the first bomb, the fat boy? Little boy. Little boy. Uh, it was being loaded on Tinian from a hole in the ground. It was, it was being pushed up into the uh, bomb bay of an airplane, uh, but the doors did not close. The doors only closed about halfway, and then they would streamline it because of the, uh, the, to, to uh, reduce the drag. Uh, I had never seen one, never heard of one, so I did answer them truthfully. And if I had ever seen it, I would not have told them anyway. And this would have been in June? You were shot down May 29th? Uh, we were shot down May 26th. 26, okay. And this so the this was the first part of June, yes. So there was a, it was not until after the war that we are learning about the, the atomic, the two atomic bombs, that I put these things together and said, this is the reason the Japanese were asking us these questions. They were very suspicious that we had some uh, bomb that would, would, uh, would uh, be large, larger than the blockbuster, apparently, and we're trying to get information of, uh, from us that we didn't know anything about. How did they get that information? Isn't that, isn't that a, I've never heard an answer to that question. Uh, the first bomb was the uh, 6th of August, the 2nd, uh, 9th of August. And it was the 15th of August that uh, we felt, uh, those of us that were in these uh, horse stalls, thought something had changed. The uh, Japanese fed us uh, a small bowl of salt soup. And we had had no salt for all of these months, so there was something changing. We, we didn't know what. Since we were bombing cities. We were war criminals, according to the Japanese. We were accused of murder. Our, our fate had been sealed. It was only a question of when they would execute us. On the, 20, on the 15th of August, uh, they took us out of the uh, horse stalls to the shores of Tokyo Bay. We were all blindfolded and tied, of course. And we could hear a clamoring going on behind us. And, and the Japanese blindfolds are just uh, narrow pieces of black cloth of some kind. And if you, if you move your head, you can actually see a little bit of what's going on. And there were machine guns set up behind us. And I thought, well, this is my last day. And I started figuring, what can I do to, you know, to, to survive this? But there was a beginnings of, a, of an argument which got louder and louder and louder. It was three Japanese people arguing with each other, three soldiers. One of them we knew was Kobayashi, which is a, the chief interrogator, and the other we called Junior. Uh, uh, there was a big difference between the two. Junior was not as brutal as Kobayashi, and but Kobayashi had the rank on him, and, uh, and uh, it was Two against one, it was they were arguing, two people were arguing with Kobayashi. And I felt that it was, uh, they were trying to prevent him from, tell, from the uh, execution of the prisoners. Kobayashi did relent, packed up machine guns, got, and was, they were put in a truck and he drove off. And there we are on the shores of Tokyo Bay. Um, Junior then, uh, uh, took us to uh, Omori, Camp Omori, which is the cause on the of the uh, island in Tokyo Bay. And we heard rumors when we got there. We heard rumors of this big bomb that had leveled the cities, and uh, and uh, that is uh, what saved my life and the life of many many uh, POWs. 29th of August, uh, uh, Harold Stassen came in and said, "You're free." And, uh, and that was a wonderful day. Um, so, so Bob, if, let's, let's talk a little about Harold Stassen. Uh, okay. You, the, the story about Halsey, Okay, he was, an, he, he was an adjutant to uh, Admiral Halsey. Um, MacArthur had ordered a, a general order that no American would set foot on Japanese soil until the surrender had been signed. 
and uh, and uh, and uh, uh, Stassen began to worry that the prisoners would be executed, and there had been an order that all prisoners should be executed if the Americans uh, invaded Japan, but uh, war criminals especially were not to leave Japan alive. Um, uh, Stassen had this discussion with Halsey, and Halsey, I can quote Harold Stassen because I've talked to him about it. Uh, uh, Halsey said to Stassen, I cannot order you to, to go into Japan and, and pick up the prisoners, but let's save our boys. And on the 29th of August, uh, Harold Stassen and a bunch of Marines came from that uh, from one of the ships out there in, in the in the bay, and and uh, uh, well, uh, I don't know what now. I know what you want to say. Okay, by that time there was only one guard, uh, only one interpreter, a Japanese interpreter left in the camp. All the guards and the commanders, everybody else, were gone. And and when Stassen came and said these are prisoners are freed, the interpreter said, "I have no authority to to free these prisoners." And Harold Stassen said, you have no authority, period. And he, his finger was itching. And the, the interpreter turned and walked away, and that's the last we saw of him. And of course, he later became governor of Minnesota, and that's... No, 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 no. Uh, he, he, was, he was a third-term governor that, he, in, in his third term, he, he resigned his governorship to join the Navy. Yes, but that, that's a, a great quote. He, he later on became president. Or was that right or wrong? <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. But that's a great quote. He said, you, know, you have no authority, period. That's right. That's what he said. But that's my connection with, with the two bombs that were discussed here tonight. Uh, and, and I can tell you that bomb saved many, many American lives. There, there's one other thing I haven't mentioned. Um, there was a, a prisoner called his, we called him Snuff, but it was Harold Curvers. He was in uh, a... a a lead and copper mine on a hill about uh, three, four miles, or maybe five miles from Hiroshima. And in the mine one day, he said somebody had told him there had been a bright light and that Hiroshima was, a, was gone. And he said, I walked out of the mine and, and looked down at, at the city. And he said there was, uh, a devastation was immense, but a guard told me not to stay there to get back into the mine. Uh, it was probably that mine that saved his life because of the radiation. Uh, 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 Snuff died, uh, I think, two years ago at age 94. And he may have been a, a, a speaker here at one time or another. Was he? Do you know Al? Or Don? Was he here? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he was a good guy, wasn't he? Yeah. So all of these prisoners felt the same way that I did, that without the, without the past, the, uh, the development of those two bombs that uh, that it would have been a different war and uh, and I am convinced that it would have cost millions of lives both in Japan and the United States so uh, uh, thank you to the author for writing about this because it's such a such a part of history that that should never be forgotten thank you you know one one last thing we might mention before we take questions Kobayashi was uh, found guilty of war crimes um, Kobayashi was found guilty of brutal, the brutal treatment and the, he, uh, the, the death of a number of prisoners. Uh, one of them, one on our crew, was decapitated on, on the order of Kobayashi. Um, he was sentenced to 20 years in prison. He was out in four. And if you want to contrast that with, uh, with the uh, uh, Tamber Zamberlini uh, book, where his tormentor, was sentenced to four years. Uh, there was quite a difference. Uh, I have a picture of Kobayashi here in an envelope. Anybody who wants to look at it, uh, he, 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 the picture was taken uh, uh, probably around the time he was uh, in, in in a court martial or whatever, and he uh, he looked the same to me. But I hope he's dead by now, <laughs> or maybe maybe sure he died is. 50 years ago. I hope. I'm sure you outlived him. Questions. What more can you tell me about this uh, gutsy guy that stole all the stuff from Punamundi and there were 300 trainloads worth? I don't know that much about him. I mean, he's 
to me he's a name and we don't have records at the missile range and stuff but uh, uh, I know that when I got to the missile range and eventually we started this Hall of Fame that people told me he should be in our Hall of Fame Unfortunately, we had no records to be able to write up a, a summary or a nomination for him because he did this stuff. He got the uh, all that V2 equipment uh, at White Sands and at Bliss. He was an obvious leader, and his men loved him. There's a great photo of him at the missile range taken in a parade field area. He's surrounded by military and civilian personnel. There's a big display, a parade of equipment, and he's the focal point of it. But I really don't know much else about him. Was he OSS? Qu question here. Um, OSS? Could you explain why Jumbo was placed uh, so close to the Trinity site? What was the purpose? And what was the assessment of risk of it being that close? Jumbo, they put it where they did because that's where they were going to, they thought about exploding. They built the tower there and stuff, so they thought about uh, actually exploding it there. So they went ahead and put it there, and uh, ground zero happened to be 800 yards away. But uh, I don't know that there was, I think it just became another test item. In other words, they built that tower, they had Jumbo there, they were going to be able to see what effect the explosion had on those things, like the tower itself and Jumbo. Uh, so it just it became another experiment. There are other experiments. For instance, one of the guys uh, wanted to do a biological experiment, and they wouldn't let him because he was too late in the process. He took a bunch of white rats from his lab up in Los Alamos and tied them by the tails on these commo lines that ran around there, and he had them at various distances. Unfortunately, he had to put them out there in the morning of the day before, and it was a hot day, and they all died of dehydration uh, before he got there. Uh, I don't think they probably would have lived if they were very close either, so. Uh, the fires and whatnot, the heat, were very intense those first half mile or so. Jim, uh, on this topic, in your book you talk about, and I think we always look at things backwards, but they didn't know what was going to happen. I think that's something that needs to be emphasized. You know, it's, it's a little more complex. There are a lot of people that talk about, well, the scientists didn't know what was going to happen and all this, and they were really afraid. And the, there was this rumor that they were going to ignite the atmosphere, uh, stuff like that. On the other hand, we know where they put the bunkers, where they designed people to be, all within safe distances. They had recovery crews out with Geiger counters, uh, north and east, downwind from the site. They knew that there was going to be a drift of radiation. Uh, they knew really quite a lot. Uh, they calculated what the light would be like, and so guys like Edward Teller at Campania Hill, 20 miles away, was putting on sunscreen. Uh, because he anticipated this flash of energy uh, hitting him, and he didn't want to suffer any skin burns. So in that sense, they did know a lot, but yes, there was still a lot of unknown. I mean, it's a little more complicated than yes, they knew something or they didn't know something. They did a lot of prep and anticipation of that explosion and had it right. Another question? When uh, President Roosevelt died in April of 45, what was the confidence level that these bombs were going to work like they did? When he died, did he know, yes, they're going to work, or maybe they're going to work, or God, I hope they work? What was the, the level of confidence of the people way at the top on what the chances of them working like they did? You know, I don't know that. My emphasis is Trinity site, what was happening in New Mexico, the politicians and the heads of the military. Um, I don't know what kind of reporting there was, et cetera. But you know when you're at the top of an organization, any organization, the information gets filtered to you at some point. And what they were receiving, uh, I have no idea. Although, you know, they were expecting something that's obvious because they had coded messages that went to Truman at Potsdam to tell him how well the test went so he could deal with Stalin. So in that sense, uh, they must have anticipated at least a good outcome, had a number of possibilities probably uh, ready to go. Going back to an earlier part of your talk, you had um, mentioned that the Germans, some German scientists had split the atom in 1938, I believe. Yes. I believe I recall reading an article a few years ago that when it came actual time to try to 
develop a nuclear weapon, one of the top German nuclear physicists made a mathematical error in his calculations and concluded they could not build a bomb? Is that true? You know, there's all kinds of great stories about that. In fact, there's another story that one of the scientists deliberately hedged his, or sabotaged the work so that they couldn't build a bomb. Uh, and so there are a number of stories like that. I don't know if they're true. Uh, I have a comment and two questions. Sir, regarding the large bombs that you mentioned that the British had, that they used in the Lancasters, I believe they were called thumpers, and I believe that they were the bombs that were used to take out the turpits in the Norwegian fjord. Yes. Now, I have two questions. First is about the detonators on Little Boy. Uh, there were several of them, and uh, I know you said that they all had to, to go at once. I'm wondering if you happen to know if all of the cables for those detonators were exactly the same length. <laughs> I'm assuming they are, because these guys attended to every detail, uh, the engineers and the scientists, and they had to take into account the time the electrical current would travel from West Point to B, and the cable, if it's three yards longer down here, wouldn't get there at the same time. Right. But I've not seen that kind of detail. This, a lot of this information is still classified. For instance, me telling you that the core weighed 13.6 or 7 pounds uh, is still classified information. But people, bright people, have reverse engineered it, so to speak, <laughs> and come up with those measurements, the diameter and the weight. If you ask Los Alamos those questions, they'll say, can't tell you. OK. The other question I have for you is about the jumbo. You had a picture of some men standing on a jumbo a day or two after the explosion. That's a piece of metal, right? And wasn't that severely irradiated when that photo was taken? The picture was taken actually sometime a, a couple of months later. So radiation levels would have been significantly less. And it takes the neutrons to activate another element to make it radioactive. And at 800 yards, the neutron, the illumination of the jumbo, for instance, would have been much less. So I don't know that the surface of jumbo was all that radioactive. It's mostly that fallout that was up in the cloud, that dust, is where the alpha beta particles, the gamma radiation is emitting from, not so much from a piece of steel 800 yards out. And by the way, concerning the large bombs that uh, Bob was talking about, I read about those because they were used against a V-2 launch bunker in, was it France? No, it was in Belgium. It was near uh, Antwerp. And uh, if you go, the bunker is still there. And according to the records, they dropped these 12,000-pound bombs on this bunker trying to destroy it. One bunker, or one bomb actually hit it and made one hole in the bunker, but the rest of the bunker survived very nicely. But there are these huge holes around it, and they've got water in them uh, because the water table's right there. So they were using them against V2 targets as well. The question arises about the Japanese nuclear program. Do you have any sense of that, how far along they were? And but the, the, uh, that might have been a reason why they were looking for a plane with a single bomb bay. I think they were probably worse than the Germans as far as getting along on their program. There's another one of those internet uh, conspiracy theory uh, stories out there that the Japanese were very far along and actually accidentally exploded a nuclear bomb in a cave in Korea. Now, given the industrial complex that's necessary to separate 238 from 235 and get the 235, I don't think they had that capability. And they certainly weren't doing it in a cave. If they were, they were using centrifuges like the Ira Iranians. And that is a long, long process. You have to keep enriching, keep enriching before you can build a really decent atomic bomb. So again, giving the scale of the effort needed to do it, I don't think they were anywhere close. The town of Windover is in Utah and Nevada. Very interesting place to visit today even. And uh, it's got an airfield where they say the hangar that held the Enola Gay 
is being restored. Uh, can you tie in how Wendover? Tibbetts, you know, Colonel Tibbetts was tied into the B-29s as the chief pilot and planner for the dropping of the bombs on Japan. And so he oversaw the training which took place in Wendover. And they dropped what they called pumpkins out of B-29s at Wendover, practicing losing that huge weight. They uh, had the actual casings for fat man bombs and uh, loaded them up with concrete and stuff to simulate the weight and dropped them there at the airfield. And so that's the tie Wendover has to the Manhattan Project. It was training the air crews, the bombing crews, to actually conduct the mission over Japan. I'd like to address a question about the Germans having uh, uh, problems with the uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, a far, uh, something called a farmhouse um, had all, almost all of the leading uh, German scientists in Britain for a while, and the British bugged the house, and uh, they listened to the conversations, and from those conversations, the leading scientist at that time was Werner von Braun, excuse me, uh, Werner Heisenberg, and he uh, uh, indicated in his talks with his fellow scientists that uh, there was no way they could have built an atomic bomb, particularly because he, the uh, early experiments they had done on um, uh, nuclear fusion using carbon, um, which is a moderator, uh, gave him a wrong result. And from his calculations, they wouldn't have gone. He just uh, said the uh, whole operation would not have been achieved uh, success. Right. Yeah, I've heard similar things about Heisenberg. Yeah. Right. Uh, also, I'd like to just point out I, my connection to uh, uh, White Sands is my Father-in-law was one of those people you know, in the Operation Paperclip. He came over with roughly 600 other scientists. His uh, expertise was uh, uh, parachutes. Actually, they call them aerodynamic decelerators. And uh, <laughs> he used, uh, did experiments after being captured by the Americans at Bayonet Point from the French. He came first into uh, uh, Wright-Patterson and then uh, eventually, because of tiring of the civil service, he uh, got to um, the University of Minnesota and became an um, aeronautical engineer. His name was uh, Helmut Heinrich. Uh, but in any case, he used uh, white sands as a, a vehicle for testing parachutes. And that's one thing that's kind of important here. There were the, the paperclip crew and von Braun get all the glory, all the news, etc., all the history. Uh, actually, we captured all kinds of scientists and technicians and engineers, and they went all over the United States to, we were just basically milking them for all the information they had. And of course, the Russians did the same thing. The Russians made the mistake, though, of their V2 scientists of putting them on ice for two years before they would believe anything they said. So they started to fall behind, but quickly caught up, and of course they beat us into space with uh, satellites and manned travel. I have a question for Bob. Um, yes? You were in prison for approximately three months. Approximately. Uh, could you explain um, what your rations were in prison and what your starting weight and ending weight was during your imprisonment? Um, can you hear me? Is the, is the mic on still? So. Um, Closer. 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 Um, we were served one rice ball a day with one cup of water a day. Whether it was rice or not, I don't know. It was purple. And I've never seen purple rice. As to weight, I was 160 pounds when, uh, when approximately, that's on my record. And what I was coming out, I don't know. Uh, probably half that. But, um, but uh, we rated, uh, when the Japanese uh, Guards and everyone left Omori. We 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 raided the the uh, <laughs> the the food supplies, and there was a lot of uh, vitamin pills in the Red Cross packages, and we put on weight really fast. But may I add one thing to this discussion? I, I want to. I, I think it's important that we should that we hear it once more. Earlier this evening, there was a small group of people that we talked to, and I had a a, a copy of a of a paper piece of paper that was dropped on cities over Japan by the B-29s. And they dropped, uh, every few weeks, they dropped, picked 12 cities to drop these leaflets. And uh, in the leaflets it said, 
of these 12 cities, four will definitely be bombed within three weeks, leave town. And if you want to do the right thing, um, tell your government to stop this war because they cannot possibly win. I know that leaflets were dropped on Nagasaki and Hiroshima. And, uh, and uh, someone once, uh, I once learned 100,000 people died in just one of those bombs. But I, I feel that it's important for us to know that um, although it was propaganda in those leaflets that advised everybody, get out of town because we're coming. And it's, it's, a little, it's a little peace of mind to know that. Question here. I just got to, I have just a comment to make. I was on the battleship New Jersey in communications, and we received that message very soon after the bomb dropped, and you wouldn't believe the celebration through the whole Seventh Fleet when that was heard because we all knew the war was going to be over. Amen. Great story. Any other questions here? Any questions over here? Pardon me. Who and when made the decision to move all the German scientists to Huntsville? I heard it was because they didn't like the climate and New Mexico and wanted a more Bavarian type setting in Huntsville. <laughs> yeah, without the mountains. Um, the thing about uh, the Germans and the, and the American government was uh, everybody thinks they went to White Sands Missile Range and uh, did all this work. The General Electric had the contract to assemble and uh, build and launch V2s. And in their records, they say that they had up to 39 German scientists working with them during the first year. By the end of the first year, in fact, it was only nine months, the Germans were all gone. They didn't do any more with GE. GE understood it. They had bright people, they had good engineers, and they could do it themselves. So really what was happening was that, and the government didn't care much about old V2s. Who wants to reproduce another V2? So at Fort Bliss, they were charged with building new stuff and designing new things. And Fort Bliss is not really a great place for that. And uh, I think some of it probably figures in that uh, they, the Germans wanted to move. But also, they were looking for uh, something for to happen in Huntsville and whatnot. And so the decision was made to move it there. I mean, there's probably political co connections in there that we don't know about how that works, but uh, a number of factors probably came together to move them to uh, Huntsville. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> you come far enough back. You're in the, in the Thank you. I believe there's a University of Minnesota connection with the Trinity site. There's a physics professor that was my fall quarter freshman, physics professor, John Williams who I believe was the second tier. He wasn't the Nobel Prize rock star physicist, but the, at the operations level at Trinity. I've read there's, a, uh, there's a John Williams in the roster at yeah, Trinity well, that site. Be, That's probably him. Yeah, I've visited some museums in Los Alamos and Albuquerque, and his name is mentioned several places in some of the books. I was impressed. Here's a top-notch physicist teaching a freshman <laughs> engineering student. Well, listen, let's, uh, let's end it here, but I, I, I want to be, uh, we should all thank uh, Bob Mickelson here for what he did for our country, what he endured. And, and again, Jim, thank you for coming to Minnesota. Support for this program provided by viewers like you. Thank you. Additional support provided through the Catherine B. Anderson Fund of the St. Paul Foundation. Upcoming roundtable topics can be found at www.mn-ww2roundtable.org. Production services provided by Barrows Productions. <laughs>